We've reached the end of our study through the book, Song of Songs. And as we conclude, I want to remind you that the book is not a book the way we would think of a typical story to be written. In other words, it's not written with a beginning, middle, and end. Remember that what we've been looking at is actually a collection of poems or love songs. Uh, with much poetic license, the book has described for us a range of themes, including purity before marriage, fun within marriage, and the significance of companionship and friendship. It describes both the highs and lows of a relationship and ultimately points us to the perfect love of God demonstrated and freely given to us through Christ's finished work on the cross. And as we wrap up our series by reading through chapter 8, I'd like to close out with giving some practical tips for those who are single or dating. My guess is that if you're single or dating, you probably eventually want to get married. Uh, by the way, let me just say that if you're not ready for marriage or if you're not looking for a potential spouse, there really is no sense in dating. As Christians, we have a high view of marriage and the desire to pursue a companion is a good one and given to us by God. But that means that dating is not just a hobby. We don't date just for fun. And that's why I like the terminology of courting versus dating. Uh, the modern day perception of dating has a different understanding and undertone. And while courting paints the picture of pursuing, getting to know someone with the end goal of marriage. So you can look at it this way. Before you're married, you court your potential spouse. But after you're married, you can go on all the hot dates that you want with your spouse. So let's begin by reading chapter 8. And let me just add that if I could go back in time, I'd probably include the first few verses of chapter 8 in our study last week with chapter 7. If you guys remember, chapter 7 was one of the spiciest and steamiest chapters of the whole book. And I think these first few vo verses continue that idea. Uh, Jasmine speaks and says this, If I can only treat you like my brother, one who nursed at my mother's breast, I would find you in public and kiss you, and no one would scorn me. I would lead you. I would take you. To the house of my mother who taught me, I would give you the spice, I would give you spiced wine to drink from the juice of my pomegranate. May his left hand be under my head and his right arm embrace me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. At first glance, what she's saying sounds a little weird. Why does she want Solomon to be like her brother? But what you need to understand is that this is written in an entirely different period of time and cultural context than we find ourselves in today. And in that culture, it was inappropriate to show public displays of affection. Now, in our day and age, this doesn't make much sense because nowadays it's not uncommon to see two people practically making babies while waiting for the train, not to mention the shameless advertisements and billboards. But Jasmine is describing how she wishes that she could sneak in a kiss to her beloved even in public. She's describing the healthy passion and desire she has for her husband. And again, as we've mentioned time and time again, within the context of marriage, this is a great thing. She goes on to describe how she wants to give him her, give him her spiced wine to drink and the juice of her pomegranate. You guys already know what I'm going to say here. You scholars can figure that out for yourselves. She describes how she wants him to embrace her. And then, once more, she gives a warning that she has given several times throughout the book. She says to not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. And when is that appropriate time? Well, if you want to honor the God who created you and who instituted marriage and who clearly laid out the parameters and design, and, and design for us to follow, then the appropriate time is within the context of marriage. Which leads me to the first piece of advice I'd give folks who are single or dating. You can write this down. And that is, you ought to put appropriate boundaries. Without boundaries in place, you are simply setting yourself up for failure. I don't care how spiritual you think you are, or how much self-control you think you have, you want to set appropriate guardrails in place to keep yourself and your potential spouse protected and pure. At the risk of sounding like a total dad, let me give you some advice on how you can do this. First of all, because the person you are courting is also a devoted follower of Jesus, like we mentioned last week, this means you both have a foundation that you're building upon and that you want to keep. So one of the first commitments and conversations you should have on the front end are these boundaries that you will maintain. Uh, what are some potential boundaries? I'm not trying to be legalistic with these things, uh, but here's just some general principles uh, that you can apply. 
Don't visit each other's homes when no one else is present. That means no sleepovers, no playing house, and no Netflix and chill because you know that that can place you in a compromising situation. As a general principle, both feet on the floor and no visits to the bedroom, no vacations alone and no long uh, road trips together. You're not going to convince me that you're going on a vacation in Cancun to sit on the beach and read the Bible all day. Okay? Get married and then go on all the vacations that you want. Put the appropriate boundaries now so that you can have a long, fruitful marriage later. Jasmine warns us to not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. Next, the young women chime in as they do time to time and they say this. Who is this coming up from the wilderness leaning on the one she loves? I love the picture that this paints, a picture of Jasmine leaning on her husband. It shows a level of dependency, of trust, of confidence and tenderness. And in a marriage, this is exactly what we are to one another. Marriage is like scaffolding, where we can uphold one another, encourage each other, and be a source of both strength and tenderness. When you're courting, make sure that you can see the other person as someone that you can lean on. If they're undependable, lazy, self-centered, and selfish now, marriage will only magnify those qualities. Uh, Let me give a special warning to the ladies in particular, because ladies, you tend to think that you'll be able to fix them with time. Uh, You can't and you won't. Save yourself the heartache and the headache and keep it moving. Uh, Let me say this to the men. Can she lean on you? Can she trust you? Can she depend on you? Will she feel safe in your arms? Will you be a provider, a lover, and a friend? So next, Jasmine speaks again, and then here's what she says in our passage. I awakened you under the apricot tree. There your mother conceived you. There she conceived and gave you birth. Set me as a seal on your heart and a seal on your arm. Here she says to set me as a seal on your heart and arm. A seal was a sign of ownership. Essentially, she's asking Solomon to commit to her long term and to love her forever. It's that phrase that we include in our vows when we get married, till death do his part. To set a seal upon the heart is to surrender his heart and his affections for her forever. To set a seal upon his arm is a physical external demonstration of that commitment. Think of a tattoo, which is a permanent mark on one's skin. It's both visible and permanent. It's kind of like what we do with wedding rings. Now, why why do we use wedding rings? Because it's an outward expression of an inward commitment and affection. It shows to everyone else that you're taken and that you're spoken for. It's a tangible symbol of an emotional connection and commitment. Which leads me to the next piece of advice I'd like to give our single and not yet married folks, and you guys can write this down, and that is to view marriage as a lifelong commitment. We've been having this whole conversation and study on love, sex, dating, and marriage from the perspective and the understanding that God designed and instituted marriage. It's His creation, and His design for marriage is one man and one woman for life. And in so many ways, our world and the culture we're surrounded by has cheapened marriage to a degree that it's not taken seriously. It's no longer viewed as a covenant between two people and before God. Now, I understand that for so many, this might be a sore topic, or maybe you wish you you would have had this information, uh, 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 information about marriage a year or two ago. And I understand that. and, And I believe that for you, there is grace and there's forgiveness. God is a gracious God who gives multiple chances and praise God for his faithfulness, even when we're not. And we can certainly have a bigger conversation about this. But remember that today's passage is some advice for those who are single or dating. And and for you, my advice is that you have the same perspective on marriage that God does. That is that you go into it realizing that it is a lifelong commitment, like a seal on your heart and a seal on your arm. Uh, Jasmine goes on to say, For love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as unrelenting as Sheol. Love's flames are fiery flames, an almighty flame. A huge turrent cannot extinguish love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. If a man were to give all his wealth for love, it would be utterly scorned. Look at the language that Jasmine uses here to describe love. She says it is strong. It is unrelenting. It is like fiery flames or huge torrents. And for anyone who has been in love, you know exactly what she's talking about. Love is like a hurricane sucking you into its roaring winds. It's like a forest fire consuming everything in its path. 
which leads me to the next piece of advice. And that is that love is like a fire, so don't light it until the right time. Uh, by the way, that passionate, burning fire that is love, it's not bad. It's amazing, and it's given by God to us to enjoy at the right time within marriage. Since it is such a force that cannot be extinguished, and since it is so strong that rushing rivers cannot sweep it away, then, my dear single friends, respect love to the degree that you will choose to treasure it and store it up until the appropriate time. Don't put yourself in a position that will lead you to compromise your purity and dishonor God. When you see a fire, you don't go up to it and stick your finger in to see how hot it is. You respect its flames and you stay at a distance. And so it is with love. And so often the question is, well, Danny, what can we do? And I'll be honest with you, I think the motive for that question is off. Because what you really mean is, where's the line and how close can you get to it? And you want to dance and jump and stomp all over that line, don't you? The truth is that you know where that line is, especially after this series, I hope. So the question should be, how far can you get from the fire so that you don't get burned? But then after you get married, let the fire burn, baby. Now, as we continue through the chapter, we have what some scholars think is her brothers chiming in for the first and only time in the book. And here's what they say. Our sister is young. She has no breasts. What will we do for our sister on the day she is spoken for? If she is a wall, we will build a silver barricade on her. If she is a door, we will enclose her with cedar planks. Jasmine responds, saying, I am a wall and my breast like towers. So to him, I have become like one who finds peace. Now this is peculiar. The, the brothers chime in and what most commentators believe is that essentially we've taken a step back in time. Jasmine is young and her big brothers are speaking up and saying, and say that if she's a wall, they will build a barricade around her to protect her, and that if she's a door, they will enclose her with wooden planks. In a nutshell, what they're saying is that they are going to step in as her older brothers to protect her and keep her from living recklessly and compromising her purity. They view themselves as, as part of their role as elder brothers as guards. How beautiful is that? To have some people in your life that truly love you and care for you to the degree that they want to act as guardians. Not to micromanage or tell you how to live, but to genuinely protect you and keep you on a path that leads to godliness and purity. The piece of advice that I think we can draw from this is that we ought to submit to community and as a community, guard one another. Community is a special gift given to us by God especially our church family. But unfortunately for so many, it's a gift that we've chosen to reject or ignore, probably for a number of reasons. Uh, chief among them may be that we do not like to be held accountable for our actions and decisions. Yet it is within the very context of community that God calls us to live out and practice our faith. And I understand that in such an isolated and individualized culture as is ours, this concept is foreign. But that's why we are called in the scriptures to live counterculturally, to live in humble submission, not to a worldly kingdom, but a heavenly kingdom and under the rule and the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. My advice for those who are single and dating is to submit to community, most importantly, your church family. And then in the church family, our job should be to lovingly instruct and protect those in our church and help them march towards a life of purity and honoring God with every aspect of their life, including this one. I remember being young and in high school, absolutely surrounded by every type of wrong worldview and ideology and influence. And I'm sure it's the same for many of you, either at your schools or workplaces, or maybe even in your home, if you don't have many Christian uh, family around you. Those voices and influences are extremely loud and can be potentially leading you down the wrong path. And that's why God gives you a church family and a Christian community to help you make the right choices, to constantly help reorient your life to the gospel and to build your life upon a God-centered foundation. To my single dating or single again folks, are you submitted to community? Have you allowed one of the guardrails in place to be the church family and other followers of Jesus that God surrounded you with? After the brothers speak, Jasmine speaks and she responds that she's been a wall. 
In other words, she had remained pure, uh, pure into adulthood, and so to Solomon, she became like one who finds peace. More on that in just a second. Now, Jasmine goes on to say, Solomon owned the vineyard in Baal Haman. He leased the vineyard to tenants. Each was to bring for his fruit 1,000 pieces of silver. I have my own vineyard. The 1,000 are for you, Solomon, but 200 for those who take care of its fruits. This passage has brought much confusion to many commentators. The big idea is that she refers to her body as a vineyard that has been kept for one person and one person only. Uh, yet again, referencing the importance of remaining pure and keeping oneself for marriage. And then Solomon responds, You who dwell in the gardens, companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear you. And then here's how it concludes with her speaking, saying, Run away with me, my love, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. The common theme of running off into the sunset in order to be alone and to be intimate echoes one last time before the book, this book of poem comes to an end, uh, reminding us that this is something that is celebrated and blessed by God. Now, as we round out our time for one last time in this series, I want to ask the question, where is Jesus? And I think we can see him most clearly when Jasmine says, so to him, I have become like one who finds peace. In other words, because of her commitment to purity, she had become peace to Solomon. The scriptures also talk about someone who remained pure and sinless. And because of his obedience and submission to God, became the perfect and sinless Lamb of God who could take away the sins of the world. And when he laid down his life, his death became once and for all our justification before God so that when God would look down upon us, he would not see our sin, but see Christ's righteousness. Jesus would live the life that we are incapable of living. He would die the death that we deserve, but then conquer the grave so that all who put their faith in him could have forgiveness of sin and new life. And when we experience this gift of grace, the Bible says we have peace. That's how the Apostle Paul describes it in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we too can have this peace with God, not because of our own righteousness or religiosity, only through Jesus' finished work on the cross. And if you want that peace, all you need to do is repent of your sins and put your faith in Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I pray for our single and dating church family. Would you help them put healthy boundaries in place to keep themselves pure and to honor you through their relationship? I pray that they would not ignite that fire until the appropriate time. I pray, Lord, that we might all see marriage as a lifelong commitment. Help us submit to community. And as a community, would you help us to guard one another? And Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who gives us peace with God. We love and treasure you above all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.